Okay. Here we are, finally. I get to see you. Well, maybe not. You get to see me. That's at least a good start. So welcome, everybody. Um, I, here we are a week into our uh, fourth quarter class, our psychology class, and I feel like the first week of all of this new stuff went pretty smoothly, so hopefully you feel the same way. Uh, as I said in our introductory video, and I probably repeated with some of my messages, uh, this is a strange situation, and because of that, uh, we want this to be low stress and uh, just try to get together, try to engage a little bit, and learn a little bit of psychology along the way. That's what we're trying to do. So hopefully that first week went smoothly for you, and I'm glad that we're uh, able to, to, to be up and running. I do hope that all of you guys are well. I hope that you're safe and you're healthy and everybody at home is. I hope that you guys are doing all the things that you need to be doing in terms of staying safe and staying well. So let's keep that up. And uh, we're going to be here together for a little bit today just to, uh, uh, for a short lecture. I don't know how many of these uh, videos I'm going to do. I'm going to give it a shot and see how they work. Uh, today, we are going to focus in and talk about uh, psychoanalytic theory of personality. Uh, and even more specifically, we're, all we're going to talk about today is uh, Sigmund Freud, the great, famous, infamous Sigmund Freud and his theory of personality. So let's do it. Um, if you haven't done it already, get out the notes that I assigned for you to copy, and you can follow along. You should have them already copied, but you can follow along with the lecture that I'm going to do today. Uh, the first page, uh, unless you drew all this in your notes, you probably don't have it, but I did send it to you, and I figured this was just a kind of a fun way to start the chapter on personality. I found this far side cartoon, and uh, it depicts what they're calling the four basic personality types. You got this uh, person up top here on the left, and she says, ooh, the glass is half full. How many of you know somebody like that? I'm sure you do. Maybe that's your personality. I don't know. Then you got this uh, guy next to her here in the top right, and he's saying the glass is half empty. How many of you know people like that? The pessimistic personality, right? Maybe that's you. I don't know. Then we have this guy down here on the bottom left, and he's saying it's half full. No, wait, half empty. No, wait, half. What? What was the question? I know a lot of people in that personality, and some of you are uh, out there right now, right? Uh, how many of you know that person? And maybe again, it's you. I don't know. And then finally, you got the grumpy guy on the bottom. He's saying, hey. I ordered a cheeseburger. He doesn't care about the glass. He's just complaining about his order. How many of you know that person, right? Okay, well, it's a funny, uh, humorous, hey, give me a break. It's psychology humor, all right? It's not that easy. This is the best I can do. It's a humorous way to look at uh, the basic idea of the different theories of personality. But uh, the humor aside, what it's illustrating is that uh, one, of the, one of the things we're going to learn as we go through this is that Personality is unique to everyone. Uh, personality is something that is yours and yours alone. Does that uh, mean that nobody shares anything in common with their personality? Certainly not. But uh, it is something that is unique to the individual. And we will uh, kind of reiterate that as we go through the chapter and learn all of the different theories and explanations about why personalities are unique, how they develop, why does one person have these certain traits, another person has these other different traits. So that's one of the things that we'll be uh, focusing on sort of as a thread throughout the whole uh, chapter. Today, we're going to focus more specifically, though, on one theory of personality. Uh, and we're going to start by just identifying the... Uh, the branch of psychology, I guess, the psychoanalytic theories of psychology. And there are several different uh, per, um, personality theories that have been developed by different psychoanalytic psychologists. Uh, today, I'm going to lecture and give you notes on one of them, Sigmund Freud. Tomorrow, you guys are going to be uh, doing an exercise on your own to learn about another psychoanalytic theory, Carl Jung. So you'll get to that uh, on your own tomorrow. Today, let's talk about this guy, Sigmund Freud. Um, probably uh, 
it's not even arguably, it's probably uh, uh, fair to say that he is the most famous name in the history of psychology. Um, and in some people's eyes, you, uh, they would say he's infamous because of how controversial a lot of his theories are, including his theory of personality. So I'm going to give you an overview of it. And then we'll look into some of the different specific aspects of his theory of personality. First of all, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Freud this way. I always like to start with a discussion of a Freudian slip. Uh, how many of you even know what that means? Have you ever heard that term before? Do you know what a Freudian slip is? Uh, I'm guessing that some of you do, um, or at least uh, many of you have probably at least heard the term before. But let me explain to you what it is. And if you understand what a Freudian slip is, you ultimately uh, understand the, almost everything that, that, that his, his theories are all about. So a Freudian slip is, occurs when uh, you say something and something comes out of your mouth that is real close to what you meant to say, but it's not exactly what you meant to say. The problem is that little change, that little mistake, that little slip of the tongue that you make changes the meaning of what you were trying to say dramatically. Let me give you a, a, an example. Um, let's just say that um, Jenny has been, uh, goes to kindergarten uh, and sits next to Joey. And Jenny loves Joey. She just falls in love with him in kindergarten. They're two little five-year-olds and she's enamored with them and they become besties uh, in kindergarten. Uh, and uh, Jenny, uh, goes throughout her whole elementary school years just having this infatuation with Joey. She loves him, right? But it's just cute because they're little kids. Well, now it gets into middle school, and they've always been friends, but Joey never looked at it as, term, you know, that they were going to uh, be any more than friends. But as they get older, Jenny has this deep-rooted love and infatuation and desire to, to be with Joey and, 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 and holds that all in through all these years, right? We go through high school. They have similar classes together, and Jenny is so happy when she sees that Joey's in her class. She hasn't told anybody about because she's embarrassed by it, and she doesn't want to be rejected by Joey. She's just glad that they're friends, but really wants more. And then all of a sudden, it's senior year, and they're at uh, someone's graduation party at the end of the year, and Jenny's there, and she sees Joey come in, and she's so excited about it, right? Oh, my God. She's like, she got, every time she sees him, she gets that nervous feeling in her belly and everything, but of course, she hasn't told anybody about all this. She's kept it inside. And so she wants to go over and talk to him. And so she goes over and she's going to say something kind of clever and, and, and nice to talk, start the conversation. So she wants to make a comment on that he has these cool Timberland boots on. And so, of course, she goes up to him. She says, hey, Joey, I really like your butt. I mean, your boots that you're wearing. And all of a sudden, she's completely embarrassed because she made one little mistake. She was trying to say that she liked his boots. And, of course, she commented on her butt. Well, it was just a mistake, but maybe a little bit embarrassing for her, but Freud would say it was a lot more than that. Freud would say that there is no mistake. There is no slip of the tongue. What, what is actually happening is you have these deep-rooted uh, feelings and thoughts and desires that you hold inside all the time, and they're always the real feelings are always trying to find a way to get out. And so a Freudian slip about Joey's butt and not his boots is really just proof that Jenny has been thinking about looking at and checking out Joey's butt probably since kindergarten. And finally, her subconscious found a way to get it out. Now, that's a ridiculous example, but hopefully that uh, makes uh, it helps you understand what a Freudian slip is. And if you do get that, you do understand that, if you've ever had an experience like that yourself, then you really kind of know your way around the, the, the basic ideas of Freud's theories. So, a couple other things about Freud. Number one, he uh, was a neurologist from Vienna, Austria. He's not an American. Um, and in the early 1900s, uh, he was studying, uh, he was a brain doctor. That's what he was uh, by, by trade. And uh, in the early 1800s, he was studying um, neurology, uh, by the time we get into the 1920s and 30s, he had kind of broken into the world of psychology and ends up becoming one of the most famous, or as I've said, infamous psychologists of uh, probably of all time, certainly of his time. 
Uh, and to, to sum up a lot of where his theories uh, are rooted, Freud believed that much of who we are, much of how our personality develops and where it comes from, is influenced by our unconscious and our subconscious. Um, what do we mean by that? Uh, those are the things that I always think of it in terms of uh, things that we bury deep down inside. I always say our belly. Now that's being much more literal and not figurative, uh, or it's actually being figurative, not literal. Uh, but these subconscious things, thoughts, feelings, desires, urges, are the things that we hold inside and, 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 and never really let out. Those are things that are um, potentially uh, things that go against the norms of society, things that we want to say or want to do, but really we shouldn't say and we shouldn't do. And so what do we do with them instead? We just hold them deep inside. He believed that those things are still having a big effect on us. Even if we're not saying them or acting on them, they are affecting how we grow and develop in terms of our personality and who we become. A lot of these things are rooted in early painful childhood experiences. Things that happen to us when we are young and in those developmental stages that we don't fully understand and we can't process as an adult would, and so instead of processing them, we bury them in our subconscious. He goes so far as to say that even the experience of being born is where it all starts. So for example, uh, Freud would say things that, well, well obviously the birth process is a very emotional, it's a very painful for the mom, for the baby, it's emotional for the mom and the baby, the dad, the doctors, the nurses, whoever's involved in it. It's a very emotional uh, process, right? Well, all of the adults that are involved in that process understand what it is, and they can deal with it and process it. That baby, as we go through that process as a baby, we don't understand what's going on, but it's still painful for us. It's emotional. There's all these hormones, and there's all these uh, emotional feelings flying around. Well, as little children, we're little infants being born, we're affected by that, according to Freud. But we start with those kinds of things already burying them in our subconscious because we don't fully understand them and know how to deal with them. Now, that's some deep, heavy stuff, and that is not me saying that. I'm just the messenger telling you uh, some of Freud's theories. Uh, ultimately, as we grow and develop, a lot of those deep subconscious thoughts, feelings, and desires are rooted in, according to Freud, erotic, psychosexual, pleasure-seeking urges that we have as humans that we can't really act on, but deep inside we would like to act on those. Uh, ultimately, he believed that we were very primal, animalistic type creatures, but all of the norms of society put rules on us that say we can't really be that way, and so we hold it inside and stay. Uh, so how did he try to get to some of these subconscious and unconscious things when he was working with patients and trying to study humans and, and their behaviors and their personalities? Well, uh, Freud was known for pioneering and using two methods uh, listed here at the bottom, free association and dream interpretation. Um, let's start with free association. Free association you may have seen in movies or on TV shows before, but it's a, it's a method where Freud would have his patients um, sit comfortably or lay comfortably, and he would create an environment where they could just relax and try to clear their minds and their heads, and then he would simply say things to them. He would say a word, and then he would instruct his patients to respond with the first thing that came to their mind. Just let it out, don't think about it. Whatever comes out, comes out. Uh, and this free association method, Freud believed, was a way to sort of break down some of our barriers and allow our subconscious to get to the surface. Say a word, just say the first thing that comes out. Freud would do this and he would, get, he would gather all kinds of data and he would look for patterns, he would look for consistencies, he would look for things that would help him understand who, uh, and, uh, who these people were and, and, and try to understand what their personalities were and, and the things that were sort of um, making them who they were. The other method that he used was dream interpretation. Um, uh, he was one of the first, uh, I shouldn't say that, he was one of the first modern psychologists to, to, to use dream interpretation. People have been studying dreams for probably thousands of years, and then since Freud, people have been studying it ever since as well. But he believed that, besides the free association method, he believed that dreams were very meaningful, were very symbolic, 
and he believed that they were also windows into the subconscious. And so he would study people's dreams, try to interpret them, and try to make sense uh, uh, out of these dreams to help people understand how they're feeling, try to understand maybe problems that they were having, and help hopefully help them deal with them. So uh, a lot of what he believed uh, in terms of dreams was that your dreams are very meaningful, and he tried to get to the bottom of that. Again, this is Freud talking, not me. There's a lot of people that disagree with a lot of this stuff, uh, but there's also a lot of sense to it when you start really looking into it. So the final bullet point that I have here on this slide uh, kind of pulls a lot of this together, I think, uh, and it's uh, re uh, references to conditions, two complexes, to use his term, that Freud theorized. He believed that boys and girls, men and women, uh, suffer from these complexes. He believed that men suffer from what he called the Oedipus complex. And if you uh, read Oedipus in one of your English classes, uh, this will make sense to you uh, because of that story. But he believed that men from the time that we're born, kind of going back to that whole birthing process where that's immediately where things start to begin uh, in terms of who we are and how we grow and develop. He believed that through the birthing process and then the nurturing process with our mother, he believed that boys develop this sexual connection to their mothers at a very young age. And he believed that deep down in their subconscious, boys have this desire to have a sexual, intimate relationship with their mother, so much so that they don't even want their father in the equation, to the point where there's these deep down thoughts and urges and feelings that, to, to almost uh, that drive us to want to kill or at least get our father out of the picture so that we can be with our mother. Now try that on for size. You want to uh, talk about why he's such a controversial figure. Uh, all of you should probably be sitting there uh, right now grimacing, thinking how disgusting that sounds, what I just described. Especially you girls, you're probably thinking, oh my god, you boys, no wonder you guys are so weird and bizarre. You're disgusting, right? Well, girls, you're not off the hook because Freud also believed that girls suffer from a very similar complex that he referred to as the electric complex. And it's just the same thing. That uh, little girls develop this uh, sexual connection to their father to the point where they don't want their mother in the picture and they just want to be with their father intimately and sexually. So you're not off the hook, girls. There's some weird underlying subconscious things that Freud believed that you guys experience when you're little too. Um, now, uh, I, can only, I can't repeat this enough. This is me telling you about Freud's theories, not my theories. However, as I said, a lot of uh, the things that Freud theorized, there is a lot of sense to them, even when some of them seem very outlandish and a little bit bizarre and almost gross, uh, like the Oedipus and the Electric Complex. All right, so uh, I have to share this story with you at this point, because I was doing this lecture many, many years ago, talking about the Oedipus and the Electric Complex. At the time, I also had my students doing a dream journal, where they were logging, trying to remember their dreams, logging their dreams, and then in the end, they were gonna try to make some sense out of what they might mean, right? So I'm doing this lecture, and as I'm guessing some of you reacted, a girl in my class reacted. I mean, she really reacted to me talking about this Oedipus and Electric Complex. Like, to the point where she, I mean, she was visibly upset. She was um, verbally expressing her, her uh, how upset she was. And I had to kind of calm her down. And like I'm telling you, I'd say, listen, Danielle, this is not me saying this. This is just me telling you what Freud's theories were, right? Okay, so we get through that. So the next day, or maybe even later in that day, the kids were working independently. It was quiet in the room, and they were doing their work, and all of a sudden, Danielle shouts out, Oh my gosh! And we all turn our heads like, What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? And she proceeds to tell us a story. She, she says that because they were keeping their dreams in a log, trying to remember their dreams and, and write them down. She had this recollection of a dream she had that week. And she was very distraught as this was all happening, and she was telling her story. She's like, oh my gosh, I just remembered a dream that I had this week. And then she told us the dream. And in her dream, she was just walking through town in Edinburgh, and then all of a sudden, the, there was this giant tidal wave that was coming to crash into Edinburgh and destroy Edinburgh and kill everybody. So people started running, and she was running up the street to try to get away from this tidal wave that was coming, right? 
Well, as she's running, her dad pulls up in a car. It's says, Danielle, Danielle, get in, get in, get out of here. And so she jumps in the car with her dad, and they're speeding out of town on the road as the tidal wave is crashing behind them. And as they're driving up the road, they see this woman running ahead of them, getting closer, and they realize it's her mom. And in her dream, her dad says, oh, we got to stop and pick up your mom. We can save her, too. Danielle turns to her dad in her dream, and she says, no, dad, leave her. You and I can just go together. And I, I mean, I couldn't have asked for anything more perfect for the timing of this dream. It just so happened that it worked out while we were going over all this. At this point, though, Danielle is crying. There's tears coming down her face. She's like, oh, my gosh. I want to have sex with my father and kill my mother. And, I mean, I had to console her and explain to her that I'm sure it was just a random coincidence. But it couldn't have happened at a better time for me teaching the class about Freud's theories. So I told her, I'm sure you do not want to have sex with your father, and I'm sure you do not want to kill your mother. It just so happened that you had a weird dream. So anyway, uh, that was a, a pretty memorable experience in class. Okay, so let's uh, move on and talk uh, uh, more specifically about Freud's theory of personality. This is sort of some general things about his theories of psychology. Let's talk about his model for personality. So let's talk about the id, the ego, and the superego. Freud believed that our personality was made up of three different parts. And all of us had all three of these parts in our personality. Those three parts are the id, the ego, and the superego. So I'm going to, going to go through each of these uh, with just a few bullet points and explain what each of these parts is and how they affect our personality according to Freud's theory. Let's start with the id. Well, let's start by doing this. I don't know how well you'd be able to see this, but ultimately, these three parts, according to Freud, could be placed on a spectrum like this. So this is our personality. We've got one end of the spectrum over here, got another end of the spectrum over here, and then all this stuff in between, okay? So on one end of the spectrum is our id. The id is the deepest, most subconscious part of who we are. The id is the part of our personality that is so deep down inside our belly somewhere, so deeply subconscious, that we aren't even aware of what's going on down there. There's things inside of us that we don't even know about. That's our id. This is the part of our personality that is always trying to seek immediate gratification. It's the me, 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 me part. It's the part that has an urge or a desire and just wants us to do it no matter what. In fact, it works on the pleasure principle. Your id basically asks the questions, the question, what do I want? And what can I do to get it at any cost? It doesn't matter. Let's do it. Now, Think about that. Could we, in our society that we live in, is that a reasonable way to live all the time? Can you always just do whatever you want at any time to satisfy any needs that you want? No, that's not reality. That's not how it works. There are, we have to consider how it affects other people. We have to consider social rules. We have to consider what people expect. We have to consider the law. Can't just go around doing anything that we want all the time, right? But Freud said there's a part of us that wants to do that. That's how we're in. Okay? There's a second part. And I'm going to jump all the way over to the other side of the spectrum over here. That other part is called, what he called, our superego. Also unconscious. Not quite as deep down as the id. But a lot of what's going on in our superego is stuff that we're not even aware of is, is in there as well. However... The superego is sort of, as the spectrum would suggest, sort of the opposite of the id. The superego, in fact, fights with and conflicts with the urges of your id. The superego works on the morality principle, not the pleasure principle. The superego asks the question, what should I do? What is the right thing to do? And that's what it wants to do. It wants to do what's best not just for you, but what's best for everybody in any given situation. 
Now think about that for a second. Is that really, can we live our life that way all the time? Can we always do what's best for everybody involved? Uh, that's a pretty tough one too. So you've got these two ends of, of your personality with these two completely different goals and they're fighting with each other to try to get their way. The id wants to just do whatever you want to do. The superego is always trying to think of what's best and what's right. And that leaves us with a third part of our personality. And that third part is your ego. And it's somewhere in the middle of this spectrum, in between these two. The ego is the mostly conscious part of who we are. The ego is the part of our personality that ends up coming out. It's the part that people see and get to know. It's the part that you're familiar with. It is always trying to rationalize and make decisions based on what the superego is telling it and what the id is telling it. It doesn't work on the pleasure principle. It doesn't work strictly on the morality principle. It works on the reality principle. It asks the question, what can I actually do in this given situation? And then it tries to satisfy both sides somehow by making a decision. Now at this point, and maybe even before this point, when you read about this in your book uh, last week and, and took the notes on it, you should be thinking of, uh, of an analogy or a metaphor or something you've seen in movies or read in books or stories that is uh, reminiscent of this and, and is connected to this idea. If we think of it in terms of movies, whenever a character is faced with some sort of decision that the character has to make, inevitably, what pops up on one side, on one shoulder of that character, right? That's where you see that little devil pop up on the shoulder, right? Oh, and guess what pops up on the other shoulder? That little angel. Well, which part of Freud's model of your personality is the little devil? It's like, yeah, come on, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. Yeah, I want to do it. I say, let's do it. That's your id sitting on your shoulder there, that little devil inside, right? Trying to urge you to do it no matter what. But then on the other side, you've got that angel. What part of Freud's model would that be? That's your superego. That's the part of your personality that's saying, wait a second, is this the right thing to do? We should think about this. What is the right thing to do? And then those two fight with each other and try to convince that character in the movie to do what they want the character to do. In the middle, you got the head. The part that everybody can see, that's your ego going back and forth. The ego has to listen to the angel, listen to the devil, and then somehow make a decision on what the character is actually going to do. And if you think about that, there's no way to prove any of this stuff. There's no way to prove that there are things down in our belly somewhere, uh, uh, subconscious thoughts and feelings, which is part of the reason for him is uh, heavily criticized, because a lot of what he theorized cannot be proven with science. However, if you think about it in terms of your day-to-day -day experiences that you go through, watching other people and how they act and the things that they do, there's a lot of sense to this. Uh, and so that is your task. I want you to think about, uh, as you go through your, your day, think about your family members, your friends, strangers that you meet, people you see on TV, uh, people you see on the news, whatever, your friends at school. Think about uh, what you see more of. Do you see more id in those people? Do you see more superego? Do you see more ego somewhere in the middle? All of us know people that are ids. All of us know people that are more superegos. I'll give you an example. My mom, Mrs. Weibel, she's the most superego person I've ever met. She does for everybody else before she ever thinks about herself, and that's just more where her personality is. But here's the thing. As you're thinking about that, when you meet people or you're evaluating your own friends or yourself, Know and realize that Freud's theory says that we all have all three of these things. It just so happens that our different personalities are pulled in one direction more than the other. There are some people that are on this end of the spectrum in their personality. They still have a superego, but they might be more in it. There are some people that are more superego, and then there's people that are balanced in the middle somewhere. So the in and the superego will conflict with each other, but they'll also conflict with the rules of society in the outside world uh, because they don't care about that. All they care about is getting what they want. We try, as we go through life, 
to, according to Freud, we try to satisfy all of these different parts of our personality. And if we can't keep all three parts happy and balanced, that's when Freud says that we can start to develop uh, problems and limit ourselves and not reach our full potential, maybe even develop into mental health problems or whatever. So, all right, so there's a little bit about Freud's model of personality. You are going to be looking at some other psychoanalytic theorists uh, like Carl Jung, uh, um, but you're also going to be doing a little bit of work tomorrow on uh, another part of Freud's theory. And so until then, I will say goodbye, and I will see you all in Schoology.